we're talking about reality here. We're not talking about some Pollyanna version of reality that if I believe these things, all my problems will be solved. Uh, or if I behave like this and don't do this and do this, that somehow I'm going to have a good life. That's, that's sort of like cheap religion. Like that's, that's dead religion. That's not, tr that's not Christ. Following Christ means I'm going to follow him wherever he leads me. And even if he leads me into suffering and difficulty, there's joy in the midst of it. Like that's the paradox at the heart of following Jesus. You know, a life with meaning is what we're looking for. We're not looking for a life merely free of suffering. The Christian life is supposed to be a deeply examined life. And I don't mean examined simply to ask questions and ask questions to ask questions, but God says, no, there are, there are answers here, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Have fun, enjoy it, you know, I'm with you. I was born in Astoria, Queens. Anybody with a Greek background in America has to be born in Astoria, Queens. It's just part of the deal. My mom's German, but when your dad's Greek, you're raised in the Greek Orthodox Church. So I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. We moved to Danbury, Connecticut when I was eight and a half. It was really a dream to move to the country. I had never played kickball. I had never played softball. But as soon as we moved up there, that whole world opened up to me, and I actually ended up doing a lot of fishing and, you know, that kind of stuff. I had an affinity for words, for poetry, but I never really got into it. But as soon as I was in college, I started studying the great books. I and mean, I'm reading the great works of Western civilization. And I said, this is it. This is what I care about. Meaning, words, ideas. We were definitely, you know, working class, middle class, uh, European immigrants. So for me to be able to get into a place like Yale was definitely a dream come true. Right before I went to college, I had a friend who was part of this sort of charismatic Catholic community and I would go and we would sort of pray and hang out. I wasn't plugged in, but it was something that I thought, this is really good, this is true. But when I went to college, I drifted away from that pretty quickly. I was somebody who wanted to you know, figure out, okay, what's the meaning of life? How do, how do people, how do you behave? What do these people do? What's the story? And it became pretty quickly clear to me that being serious about Christian faith was not the way to fly. I thought, okay, so, that must be part of the truth, but truth must be something much bigger than just, you know, this parochial idea of the Bible and stuff. And so I became very deliberately open-minded in, in that traditional sense. I graduated from Yale and, you know, I'm trying to be a writer. I sold a humor piece to the Atlantic Monthly, which was amazing. I sold a short story to some magazine and I got into Yaddo and the McDowell Colony, which are very, very hard to get into. And so I thought, you know, clearly I'm on this path and I'm going to be a successful writer and, and I was getting these accolades, but just about when I turned 24, I was really lost and I didn't know what to do, so I ended up moving back in with my parents, which was in some ways a very, very bad idea. You know, my parents had this attitude, which I think is a healthy attitude, that, hey, excuse me, Eric, didn't you graduate from Yale University? Oh yeah, well, maybe you should get a job. I got a job as a proofreader at Union Carbide in Danbury, Connecticut which is the Aramaic word for hell. I mean, it was the most boring, mind-numbing horror for me that I could have ever experienced. But while I was in this miserable job, living with my parents and, you know, really uh, unhappy, um, I met a guy who was in the graphic design department. His name was Ed Tuttle, and he was a serious Christian. But he was an Episcopal, he went to an Episcopal church, so I thought it's, it's so safe to talk to him. You know, he's not like one of those. Of course, he was one of those and he knew the Bible backwards and forwards. We had these wonderful conversations, and I was always wanting to know more and asking questions, but don't get too close. Like, I don't want to pray with you. I don't want to do Bible study or anything, but what about this? What about that? Whatever. I, I had the basic questions. Like, I thought, you know, surely civilized people cannot believe that, you know, there are angels and devils and demons and Satan, and or that the Bible is literally true, that these miracles happen. I mean, all that stuff struck me as being obviously something from the past that we couldn't believe anymore. But I started asking him about this, and he always had these amazing answers. I didn't necessarily agree, but I was really intrigued. I said, there's clearly much more to this than I have been led to believe. I was at a real crisis point, okay? I mean, I was 24 years old. I've been out of Yale for four years, and I'm now forced to look, to look for answers. I'm saying, I don't get it. What's going on? Is, does life have meaning? Is there meaning to life? Every now and again, this, this, this friend of mine said to me, you know, why don't you pray that God would reveal himself to you? And I remember thinking, Pray to what? Like, if I don't believe God is there, who am I going to pray to? Part of me, while I was at Yale, had thought about this whole idea of, you know, Jung's idea of 
the collective unconscious, maybe this God that people are talking about, really all they're talking about is this, this kind of new age Eastern force, this, this uh, intelligence behind everything. Maybe it's a kind of a, it's a cosmic energy force. Uh, perhaps there's something that connects us all together. Jung called it the collective unconscious. That, that sort of appealed to me a little bit. It wasn't so uh, anthropomorphic and, and sort of old-fashioned of the guy, you know, on the cloud with the beard or Jesus or anything like that. I wanted to know what's what, and I didn't know how to find out. My uncle uh, got sick and actually passed away. And in the middle of that crisis, this friend of mine said, can I pray for you? Uh, and then he said to me, all oh, my friends in my church are praying for your uncle. I was staggered. I mean, now we're not talking about intellectual conversations and questions. We're talking about this sweet man telling me this sweet thing that all these strangers are praying for my uncle. I was really moved by that. And I was also really touched by this idea that they're praying to some God about something. Like they really believe that God answers prayer, you know, not that he's going to answer prayer every time or the way we want him to, but just the concept of it kind of blew me away. And as it turned out, uh, the, the guy uh, asked me, could he pray with me? And because my uncle was in a coma, I was suddenly willing to say, yes, let's pray. So we went to this like miserable conference room at Union Carbide and he prayed. I'd never done this before, closed my eyes and, and my friend prayed and it, something happened. I mean, it was really uh, clearly real. Something real happened. I can't put my finger on it, but when I opened my eyes, I thought, that was real. What was that? You know, I, I had suddenly become engaged somehow. And it was right around that time that I had this dream, which changed everything. So the background of the dream, or the background of my life, at that point in my life, there were roughly three things that I would say were important to me. Number one was growing up with the sort of Greek identity. Growing up, my dad always would explain to me that the fish on the back of a car, okay, was a Greek, it was five Greek words, it was an acronym, ichthys, fish, Jesus Christos Theos Imon Sotir, Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Savior. The other piece of it was I grew up in Danbury, Connecticut, and did a lot of fishing. I mean, if somebody said, what's your hobby? I did a lot of, I did bass fishing and fly fishing and ice fishing, and that was my life, really. And, and then the third piece of it is kind of the intellectual piece. I was trying to figure out the meaning of life, and I came up with this idea about God and everything, I thought, okay, maybe what all religions are talking about is sort of the same thing. It has to be the same thing. It couldn't be that Christian thing. So probably what they're talking about is this Eastern idea. And, and I remember I came up with this image, which borrows a little bit from Jung and a little bit from Freud, and this idea of the, a picture of like a frozen lake. And the ice is the conscious mind. And the water beneath the ice is the unconscious mind. And so the unconscious mind, the collective unconscious, is God. It's this energy force that's beyond us. And in a sense, the goal of life, to have spiritual health or psychic health, is to have um, some sort of uh, conversation between the conscious mind and the unconscious, that they're sort of communicating with each other, I should say. So I thought, in a way, the goal of life is to drill a hole in the ice, to drill through the ice to touch the water collective unconscious, God, whatever you want to call it. That's probably the goal of all these religions. So these are three things that form the background. It's sort of the Greek thing, the fishing thing, and then this intellectual journey. And here I am at this point around my 25th birthday where I'm really searching, I'm in pain, I'm suddenly open to the idea of God, what have you. So one night I go to sleep and I have the dream. And the dream is that I'm standing on a frozen lake. I'm standing on Canwood Lake, Danbury, Connecticut. The lake is frozen. It's this glorious winter day. The sun is bright, the ice and the snow are, are bright, the sun is shining off them, the sky is incredibly blue, and there we are ice fishing. I look down and I see a fish kind of sticking its snout out sort of through the hole, which tends not to happen when you're ice fishing. It's kind of, it's usually a little harder than that, right? So in the dream I kind of lean down and I reach down, I pick up the fish by the gill and I hold, hold it up and it's a pickerel or a pike, it's this beautiful bronze fish and it just looks gorgeous in the, in the, in the sun, it almost looks golden. And then in the dream I realize, no, it doesn't look golden. It actually is golden. It's like a fairy tale. It's like in this dream, I'm holding up a golden fish. It's alive and it's made of gold. It's this, this, this miracle. And suddenly in the dream, I'm aware of the fact that this is, God is, is speaking to me because suddenly I realize in the dream, this golden fish is ichthys, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. I realize that this golden fish is Jesus Christ. And I'm standing there in the dream holding up this fish, aware of the fact that my hope that this could be true, but I believed it, you know, 
it really, you couldn't know or whatever. Suddenly in the dream, I realize it's true. Jesus is real. I have him. In the dream, I'm holding this fish, knowing this is the Christ. And I'm flooded with joy in the dream because I realize that God has used my own symbol system to one, sort of one-up me, to blow my mind. Because all I wanted was to reach through the ice to touch inert water, which I thought was this collective unconscious God. And, and, and God is saying to me in this dream, no, 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 I have something more for you. I have my son, Jesus Christ, who's a living being, a person. He's alive. And I woke up and I went to work and I told my friend about this dream. And, and he said, well, what, do you think it, what do you think it means? You know? And I said to him what I know I never would have dreamed of saying up until that point. I said, it means I've accepted Jesus. You know, there's certain things that are true, but it doesn't mean you can prove them. Just because somebody can't explain something doesn't mean that it's not A, explainable, or B, true, you know? And I think that the idea of that dream doesn't particularly prove anything. On the other hand, it's either true or it's a lie. It's not just what's important to you, you know? It's, it's, this is way beyond just what's important to you.